I start this slide, I use this slide at the beginning of every presentation I do internally because I never ever want people to forget that diversity and inclusion is absolutely vital for Fujitsu to continue to grow and thrive and succeed as a business. If you were told that your company would be 45% likelier to grow its market share or would generate 1.4 times more revenue or be more profitable if you did one simple thing, you would want to do it. So if that simple thing is to make sure that your workforce really reflects the diversity of your customers and that you have an environment where everyone feels valued and feels able to contribute their ideas and give their best at work, why wouldn't you do that? Now, a lot of people think it's more important to do diversity and inclusion because it's the right thing to do. Well, yeah, it is the right thing to do. But do you know what? It's really easy to stop doing the right thing when times are tough and to say, that we'll save that for a nice day. This isn't just the right thing to do. It's absolutely vital. I talked about digital transformation before. We're going through it. Most companies are. Almost every business in the world, if they're not doing digital transformation right now, is probably not going to exist in 10 years' time. So when we're really touching on every part of life, the way we live, the way we work, the way we communicate, you absolutely need to have a diverse group of people in the room bringing all those different experiences and perspectives so you can create solutions that work well for everybody, not just for the people in the room. I don't know if any of you remember seeing this video that went a little bit viral about a year ago on the right. It shows two people trying to use an automatic soap dispenser. It dispensed soap for someone with white skin, but it didn't for someone with a darker skin tone. Now, the people who designed that automatic skin soap dispenser had clearly designed it to detect the color of white skin against the background. They would, I'm going to assume that they were not horrible racist people and they did not set out to create a soap dispenser that wouldn't work for people with darker skin tones. I'm going to assume that everyone in that room was white and it didn't occur to them. It's really hard for us to escape the lens we see the world and think about different people's needs. And if someone's missing from the room, that's what ends up happening. The example on the right, does anyone have an Apple health tracker? Do you remember when they did their big fanfare about the Apple health watch? And it was meant to do everything to do with health you could ever have. You know, it was going to monitor your alcohol and your sleep and your exercise, literally everything. It didn't have a period tracker. For the benefit of those in the room who are men or who might not know this, pretty much if you're a woman and you go to your GP, the first question they ask you, no matter what you go with, you could have broken your arm, would be what was the date of your last period. So. If you don't have that, it just says to me there were no women involved in designing that and thinking about the health needs of women. If you don't have diversity in the room, you don't get a solution that works well for everyone. And the work that all of us as tech companies are doing is too important to only work for part of society. That's why we need to make sure that we're really attracting diverse talent. Now, the challenge we've got is 78% of large organisations are actively trying to recruit higher numbers of female hires. I think this might have come from PwC as well, actually. Um, we're all competing for the same talent, and that's really important to know. We're noticing now that we're losing more of our female employees, not because they're not happy, but because they're being really targeted and poached. Women are like the golden ticket right now. So if you want to be able to attract women, you need to do better. The problem with it is we all want women, but what's holding us back is bias. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about the nature of unconscious bias. I would assume and hope as recruiters that you're all familiar with it already. If you're not, the most important thing for you to know is that every single one of us has unconscious biases. It's not because we're bad people. It's because we're people. It's just how people work. Now, those biases don't just affect the kind of choices you make about who you hire, but it also affects the way you approach recruitment as a whole. It's so easy to put your biases into the way you design the recruitment process, the way you create your job specs, and so on, that you might be deterring women without meaning to. And no matter how many pictures of really glossy, nice, happy-looking women you put on your website, if they read your job description, if they come to your interview panel and they get that sense of that bias, they won't want to work from you. 
So a big part of the work we've been doing over the past few years is looking at our process in a totally fresh way and looking at where that bias can come in and what we can do about it. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. Yeah. Women and men tend to look for slightly different things from jobs. Um, not all women and not all men, but on the whole, women are more likely to value the relationships they have at work. So it's really important to them to know about the people they'll be working with. They are more likely to value flexibility. I would say increasingly though, that's not just a women thing. I think everyone values flexibility. Um, and if you, know, if you can't offer it, you're gonna suffer, but it is particularly important for women as women still do have more caring responsibilities. Those kind of things might be a bit obvious, but we also found that women are much more inspired by a sense of purpose and by responsible business. That it's really important to them to know that they'll have learning and development opportunities. And the role models is really important. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this piece of research, but you have to see four role models who look like you doing something before you really believe that you can do it. That's why that one picture of the women on the website isn't quite enough. Women know that there are biases out there, that it's difficult for them to succeed in certain companies. And that's why they're looking for evidence that people like them will not just be hired by your company, but will be able to progress their careers, get to the top and do well. They're slightly less motivated by men than the overall package. And yet, when I look at most jobs out there, when I see anything about the organization, the culture, all I really see is that you've got a generous competitive salary. I don't see anything about the softer benefits. I don't know if you know that you've got good family packages, that you've got good flexible working, that you have a women's business network, that you've won awards for diversity. Those are the kind of things that are signals to women that you're the kind of company where they want to work. What is the impact of gendered language in an advert? For those of you who can't see, the pictures on the side are two different adverts around sports. One I would say is really targeted at women and the other I would say is really targeted at men. The male one says, find your greatness. And the one targeted at women says, I play with passion, precision and pigtails. Now, marketing and advertising know that you target segments. They design things appealed to women and men. As recruiters, you, a job advert is an advert. You are advertising that company. Do you think about the words and images you're putting in and who they're going to attract and what you want? When you have those masculine and feminine words in job adverts, the research shows that where you have more masculine words in a job advert, a woman is less likely, is just as likely to believe that she's a good match for the skills, but is far less likely to believe that she'll be a good cultural fit. She's more likely, and so by the way, are men, to think that it's a male-dominated culture. And overall, that company, that ad, is less appealing to a woman and she is less likely to apply. Interestingly, when you reverse it, if you take a job ad which has more female words in, it's less appealing to men but they're no less likely to apply. They're not deterred at all from applying. I believe that that's because of what I said earlier, that women know they need to find a company where they can succeed and where their gender won't be a barrier. And subtle things like this are what tell them. Now, when they did this research, they asked the women if the language in the adverts put them off, and they all said, no, no, no. And yet, when they showed them the different adverts, they got these results. So no one would know this was why. It's unconscious. It's that unconscious bias coming through. So given that people don't know they're seeing these words in ads, but it still has that impact on them, you probably don't know you're putting those words into ads as well. We took some of our adverts, and we used different software like Textio and Be Applied to evaluate how male or female they were. The two on the left came up as really poor, very masculine. The one on the right was a rewritten version of one of them, and it did far better, but it was still slightly masculine. What was wrong with these job adverts? Well, they had too many requirements in them. Alexa spoke earlier about the fact that women are more feel the need to fit every requirement on a job advert, and they won't apply if they don't. Everyone always focuses on this as if it's something wrong with women oh, they won't apply if they don't meet all the requirements. Really, women apparently are much more accurate in assessing their own skills and how good a fit they are, and men are just a bit more have a go. So really, this is an issue with men 
Um, but let, let's overlook that for now. What people think is they often take this a little bit too literally. They will hear that women need to match you know, nine or 10 out of 10 requirements. They'll say, I'll take off two requirements. It isn't just about the number of requirements. It's about the type of requirements and what you're really looking for. So for example, I sometimes see on job adverts something saying, you need five years experience in this field. If a woman has four and a half years of experience, she's probably not going to apply. The same 90% rule applies, whereas a man would with four years experience. Now, do you really need five years experience in a job? I'm sure that we all know people who've done the same job for five years and done it really badly. I would much rather have someone with two years experience who would do a great job and who's really talented. Fine to say you want someone who's done it before, but why specify a time? Think about what you really, really need in terms of type of person, not just experience and background. What kind of aptitude do you need? Do you need a really good communicator? Do you need a team player? Do you need a creative? Do you need someone who just gets on and gets things done? We very rarely think in those terms. We often just think in terms of the list of tasks someone has to do. But actually, you need to think about that balance of personalities in the team. Make sure that the job adverts are written in a personal way. Don't talk about the job holder or the role holder. Talk to the person, ask them questions, make the job advert a conversation, and that's more likely to draw women in. Use that gender neutral language. There's lots of research out about it. I'm more than happy to share some links to those words which are seen as male and female. And make sure you promote the full range of benefits. Really simple, but when we just added a simple line on our job adverts saying that they were open to applications for flexible working, we had three times as many female candidates apply. It's just for one line on a job advert. It's amazing that a word can have so much impact. This is just one example of some of the changes we've made to debias our processes. We've really put an emphasis on building balanced shortlists. We make sure that we have balanced panels, so you have to have you know, a gender balance panel um, or ethnicity balance panel. The reason for that is twofold. One, because we all have biases, we all prefer people like us, so when you have a mix of people on the panel, it helps to counteract that. But again, we're also thinking about that candidate experience. If you see all this stuff on our website that we're a Times Top 50 employer for women and we really value women, and then you come in and you just meet men and are interviewed by men, you're going to have a bit of a question mark about whether we really mean it and whether it's true. The candidates want to see people like them doing well here. We've done a bit of work on interview structure. Um, I'm sure all of you know hiring managers who like to take people to the pub and just see what they're like over a beer. So we try and get them to be a bit more focused, really push them away from asking those personal questions, which we all know are illegal, and yet many of our hiring managers don't seem to realise. And we have mandatory unconscious bias training for all hiring managers. You might have seen some research out there about the value of unconscious bias training, whether it really changes anything. Uh, the answer is that, well, a 30 minutes course is never going to change an entire lifetime of unconscious attitudes. That's not what it's for. But what it does do is get your hiring managers to understand why you're putting all these other things in place that they think of as an annoying bureaucracy and get them on board with what you're trying to achieve. And that's why I'd say it's really worthwhile.